Hey guys, welcome back and thanks for joining me on this lovely fall day. I'm your host, Sherry. Today's case is about a man who was a retired Dallas firefighter. He disappeared on the most normal day in 2017. Lots of weird stuff to unpack in this one. My sources are listed in the description area. This is the case of Michael Chambers. Let's get in our little time travel machine and head back to 2017 when this case began. Donald Trump became the 45th president. We had the first total solar eclipse in 99 years. I remember being at work and walking outside to watch it, and it was super cloudy. Twitter upped its character limitations from 140 to 280. Kroger was the most popular supermarket chain. Prince Harry got engaged to Meghan Markle. O.J. Simpson was released on parole after serving nine years for robbery and kidnapping. And lastly, we lost Chris Cornell, Chester Bennington, Greg Allman, Malcolm Young, and Chuck Berry. So much talent was lost that year. We were all still getting over the death of Prince from the previous year. Michael Glenn Chambers is a 70-year-old man who lives in Quinlan, Texas. Now, Michael was a Dallas firefighter for 36 years. He retired in 2008 he is well-loved in his community and always helping out wherever he can. Basically, a good family man and everyone's grandpa. He and his wife have a gorgeous bungalow house on 10 acres of property. His son-in-law says that this man is known for two things. Number one, he did not have a single enemy. And number two was how much he loved his wife. He would literally do anything she asked. He basically worshipped the ground she walked on. He cooked dinner. He made her coffee every morning. His wife's name is Rebecca, but she goes by Becca. This was his second wife, and they have been married since 1980. Becca is 10 years younger than Michael. He and Becca adopted two boys, and Michael had two daughters from a previous marriage. These four kids are full-grown adults at the time this story takes place. By this point, he and Becca had been married for 37 years and have nine grandchildren and eight grand great-grandchildren. Michael is known to, on every holiday, be the one helping cook dinner and then hanging out with all the grandkids in the living room. Everyone wants to play with grandpa. His granddaughter said that when she was younger, every time he threw one of them up in the air, you never had to worry that he wasn't going to catch you. He is well-loved and would do anything for his family. Michael's passion is restoring old cars and was often seen working in his workshop. I call it a workshop, but it's actually this large detached garage next to his house. Like it has heating, air conditioning, and a bathroom. It's like the size of a three-car garage. This was where he spent a lot of his time working on restoring old cars. He was part of a weekly car group called Texas Most Wanted, where the guys meet once a week and talk about their restorations to old cars. Becca works during the day, and this was when Michael spent a lot of the time tinkering around out there. He's basically just enjoying his retirement and doing whatever he wants every day as he should. Michael is in excellent health, and he has no substance abuse issues or any medical or mental health issues. He is a deacon at their church and a member of a gospel band that frequently played nursing homes and churches. On the morning of Friday, March 10th, 2017, Becca goes to work at her job as a home health aide. This is the most normal of days. Becca calls or texts him that morning to ask him to go to Walmart and pick up some mascara for her. But other than that, he's just going to work on one of his cars and chop firewood. Later that evening, Becca texts her husband like she always does and says she's on her way home from work. When she gets home, she notices things are a little different than usual. First, the garage door wasn't opened, like it always is. Michael usually comes out of the garage and greets his wife. And he then carries her pocketbook inside for her, and then he'll go get cleaned up and make dinner. Today, the garage door is shut and locked and lights are off. 
Michael's truck, which is his normal daily use vehicle, is still is still there. So she just assumes he's inside the house, except the house is empty. She calls his cell phone, but it goes to voicemail. She calls their kids and none of them have heard from him. She walks through the house and in the bathroom sees the mascara that he had picked up for her sitting on the bathroom sink. The receipt was in the bathroom trash can. Becca remembers that Michael said something about cutting firewood today, so she walks around their 10 acres of property and looks for him along with a couple neighbors, but there is no sign of Michael. Michael stands at 6 foot 3 inches and 225 pounds, so you'd think he'd be easy to spot if he were outside. She gets her keys, and her and one of the neighbors walked out to the garage, which was locked up with the lights turned off. She can tell he had been working in there that day. There's also his wallet and keys sitting on the table. Becca notices what appears to be blood on the garage floor, like large quarter-sized droplets of blood. Not a ton. It's more like if you sliced your hand pretty bad while working, but this is enough to be worrisome. Becca thinks there's a possibility this could just be transmission fluid. Her neighbor who is with her is a retired police officer, and he calls police. By this point, it's around 7 o'clock p.m. Police believe it's possible that Michael was a victim of robbery, but they notice his wallet is still there, his 12-gauge shotgun is sitting in the spot it normally sits in, and there's a lot of expensive tools laying around the garage that are untouched. What's worse is that $1,000 in cash was found in the console of Michael's truck in the driveway. The robbery theory is beginning to seem less likely. His wallet that was in the garage had only one thing missing out of it, and that's his driver's license. They did find a wooden dowel rod, and on that wooden rod was remnants of blood. The sheriff believes it's possible Michael was hit with that wooden rod, and that's what caused the blood to land on the garage floor. I looked at the photos of the blood splatter, and it's definitely one of the strangest patterns I've ever seen. These are perfectly circular, quarter-sized, bright red droplets. Police say the blood droplets were almost too perfect. When there's a struggle, you're going to see blood smears and find blood in other spots. Crime scenes are messy. This was not. Michael's cell phone was pinged and was found to be turned off or the battery was dead. It pinged near Lake Tawakani, which is approximately 17 miles from their home. But remember, Michael's truck is still parked out front. So how did this cell phone end up 17 miles away? And we'll get into that soon. Police and family and friends launch a massive search. This man is a retired firefighter and well-respected community community member. They're going to go all out for this one. They searched all day and all night and nothing came up. The sheriff says Michael is a personal friend of his and a devout Christian and that he would trust him with his life. This sheriff attends the same church as Michael. The next day, they try to piece together Michael's day, and it's going to be tough. They know he went to their local Walmart in the morning, so they get surveillance footage of him shopping at Walmart. I don't know if he purchased anything besides Becca's mascara. I heard there was a bottle of antacids, but I can't confirm that. But the surveillance footage shows him paying for the makeup at 11 o'clock a.m. Michael is alone and doesn't appear to be under duress of any kind. The footage then shows him walking back out to his truck where he climbs in and leaves. Other stores in the area are checked and it's not believed that he made any other stops while he was out. Police bring in bloodhounds to search his property and the dogs showed that Michael's scent ended at the end of his property near the road. But it's difficult because he lives there. His scent is going to be all over the place. The, pro- the dogs are probably confused as hell. They also have divers search a nearby pond, and there's still no sign of Michael. There is a helicopter flying above Michael's property looking for him, but there's still no signs. Police make pleas to the public to report anything they saw out of the ordinary that morning that may involve Michael. The family sets up a $25,000 reward for any info that could lead to locating him. Neighbors say that they saw nothing out of the ordinary that day, just Michael working in his garage like he does every day. Some folks begin to raise concern that Michael's disappearance could have had something to do with his son, Justin. Justin is 31 years old and lives two hours away from his parents. He was in various foster cares as a small child before Michael and Rebecca adopted him at age four. He was known for constantly calling his dad and asking for money. 
Michael usually helped him out, but a couple months ago, Michael tells his wife he's done. The boy is 31 years old, and it's time he has to learn to survive on his own. It's time for him to take care of himself. They did keep Justin on their cell phone plan, but that's where the handout stopped. Justin would still call and argue with his dad about money and even threatened him before. So police bring Justin in for questioning, and he admits that he hounds his dad for money a lot, and there was tension between them. But he insists he loves his dad and would never do anything to hurt him. Justin tells police he was at work all day. The police check into this and find that, yes, Justin was at work, just as he said he was, and his alibi was solid. He was given two polygraph tests and and passed both times. Between the alibi and the polygraphs, Justin is eliminated as a suspect. Back to the blood droplets found in the garage. The blood was tested and found to have belonged to Michael Chambers. The blood splatter analyst says these drops are too perfect, like perfect quarter-sized droplets. You guys have to Google these, almost as if they were staged. They also said since the color was bright red, it could suggest the possibility of an anticoagulant, which means the blood may have been drawn in advance and then preserved in a vial of some sort and then intentionally splattered to make it seem like there was a crime that took place on the garage floor. On March 20th, 2017, this is 10 days after Michael disappeared, Becca does something strange that had a lot of folks scratching their heads. First, she removes Justin from their cell phone plan, and then she cancels Michael's cell phone service. People are stunned because what if he needed his phone to call? Remember, his cell phone is still missing and last pinged at the lake 17 miles from his house. Why suddenly cancel his service so soon? He's only been gone 10 days. Her explanation was that it was to save money. Michael's not here, and she feels she needs to save money wherever she can. Even with having no service on a cell phone, you can still dial 911 if needed, thank God, but it's a really strange thing to do. Next, she wants to sell Michael's truck. This is his daily, everyday vehicle that he is still making payments on. So she she requests a temporary death certificate. She assures her kids that this is just a temporary one and only for a formality. The rest of the family almost couldn't believe it and strongly objected to this, but Rebecca insists this is because she is going to need the money and can't afford to continue making payments on the truck, and this is just a temporary death certificate. In June 2017, this is three months after Michael disappeared. Becca is brought in for a polygraph. The reason she wasn't given one before this was due to medication she was taking. The polygraph shows that Becca had multiple affairs throughout their marriage. She wouldn't elaborate to police when they confronted her about this. She just said that Michael knew about her affairs and always dismissed them and never confronted her about them. It was just something they didn't talk about. Remember, this man worshipped the ground she walked on. He was going to let her do whatever she wanted to as long as she was happy, according to her. Her family was shocked to learn that she had been having an affair. They were under the impression that mom and dad had a perfect marriage. And this caused some major family friction. Becca only talked about one man, but not the others. She says the affair ended five months before Michael disappeared. Becca passed the polygraph when asked about if she had anything to do with Michael's disappearance. Her former lover is called in and he passed a polygraph. He also had an alibi for the day that Michael disappeared. I feel like this particular police station is putting a whole lot of faith into these polygraph tests. Like, well, every suspect passed a polygraph, so they're immediately eliminated. It's important to mention that the FBI was brought in for this case early on. The FBI is a whole lot better at these kind of things. The other men she was having affairs with were all interviewed and they were cleared as suspects. A few months later, Susie, who is Michael's daughter, gets a Facebook message from a man who says he has info about what happened to her dad. He says Becca and another man killed Michael and he knew where the body was. Susie notifies the case detective, and the area was searched where this man claimed the body was, but nothing was found. The police think this man just wanted the $25,000 reward money. He was also a known convicted felon. The weird thing about this, though, is that the man said Becca and another man had killed Michael. Whether it's a lie or not, this is strange because police hadn't made it public that Becca was having multiple affairs. 
As far as the public knew, Becca and Michael had this picture-perfect marriage. I feel like this man knew something about this family. Becca ends up calling police one night, when, and when they arrive, they say she wanted to file a restraining order against Justin, her son. The reason was because he had confronted her of, after showing up to her house and questioning her about his dad's disappearance. He knew his mom was cheating on his dad, canceling the cell phone plan, her behavior. It was enough to make Justin irate and finally confront her. Family members and even the police found this request for a protective order strange. Justin didn't get physical with his mom. He just went there to question her and she became upset. Two days after this confrontation by Justin, the family discovers, do you guys remember Becca getting that temporary death certificate so she could sell Michael's possessions in order to have money for survival? Well, it was actually a real death certificate, not just a temporary one. Michael was declared legally dead months before. Because Becca had gotten a real final death certificate, she was collecting Michael's $750,000 pension payments. They had no idea Becca was collecting all this money and had filed for a death certificate. The sheriff's office signed off on the request for the death certificate because Becca had explained she needed the money. If Michael's not in the house, his retirement checks would stop. Now, now that she had the death certificate, she had tons of money filtering in every month. Becca was the sole beneficiary to Michael's entire estate, which was valued at $300,000 plus his $750,000 pension. If he's presumed alive, she gets nothing. If he is dead, she gets everything. So she filed for the death certificate. To me, this is strange because Michael had only been gone for a month. I get the finance part of it, but that is a really short time. Most people wait at least 10 years before they're they declare their missing loved one dead. Think back to the Richie Edwards case. It was 13 years before he was de declared legally dead. And think back to Ray Grecar. He's been missing for 17 years, but was legally declared dead after six years. His estate was in the millions. You guys see the pattern here? Michael Chambers was declared legally dead after four weeks. Texas law states a person must be missing for a period of seven years before they can be declared dead and a death certificate can be released. But Becca somehow was able to convince the judge that Michael was dead. What that proof, with what proof, we don't know, but it's likely the blood droplets. Because there is a lack of evidence in this case, police are forced to look into theories that don't involve foul play, such as suicide or staging his own disappearance and living incognito somewhere. One theory is that Michael hurt himself in the garage, which explains the blood on the floor, but not the bloody rod. After this injury, he wandered outside disoriented and injured. The problem with this theory is that Michael would have been found. Friends and family say he was not depressed and had no mental health issues, but suicide is what police believe happened, and I'll explain why. In October 2017, a cell phone expert was brought into the case. Even though we don't have Michael's cell phone, it's never been found, this cell phone expert can look at the data and piece together its whereabouts throughout the day. He finds the cell phone left the house after Michael's return from his Walmart trip. It headed out to Lake Tawakini, which is 17 miles from his house. It was traveling at speeds that were consistent with being in a vehicle. The data shows the phone stopped at the Tawakini Bridge for 15 minutes and then headed back. Later that day, the cell phone goes to the bridge location again. However, that's where the pings stop. Through this cell phone data, they were able to discover that he had been traveling these 17 miles back to the bridge at around four miles an hour, which is faster than the average walking speed, but much slower than driving a vehicle. So how was it traveling 17 miles at four miles per hour? It's believed he was riding a bicycle. It was also found that a bicycle was missing from his garage, but the family disputes this, saying Michael only had one bike and it was in decrepit condition and hadn't been ridden in years and it was still at the house. This makes me think that Becca maybe told police he had this other bike, but his kids are like, there's no other bike. Neighbors were interviewed and they claim they never once saw him ride a bike as long as they've known him. The problem with Michael being on a bicycle is that he had really bad knees. He was in good shape and active, but his friends at the car club say he could only stand for around 30 minutes before having to take a break and sit down. 
It's unlikely that Michael was able to pedal 17 miles in one shot, even though Michael was in good health. At the end of the day, Michael is still a man who is six foot three and 70 years old, 70 years old. He's, his knees are going to be bad at this point in his life. Let's say he did go to the bridge and jump off. If you look at a picture of the Tawakani Bridge, you'll notice one thing that's pretty easy to observe. This bridge, although two miles long, is very close to the water. It's only nine feet from the bridge to the water. No one could really pull off a suicide on this bridge. As well, he would have had to throw the bicycle off the bridge. No bike or body has ever been recovered, and this lake was searched with sonar equipment. I also need to mention that there were construction workers on the bridge that day that certainly would have noticed if a man on a bicycle came pedaling up and jumped off. I think it's safe to say that Michael did not jump off the bridge. Again, no history of depression. He had plans to attend his grandson's soccer game the next day and was looking forward to it. Most of the time, suicidal people leave a note and no note was ever found. Police say they believe Michael committed suicide and they know what the motive was, but they won't release it. They say Michael had a motive to commit suicide. It could be anything from his wife cheating on him to maybe he owed $200,000 in back taxes and the IRS was going to take his house and his possessions. We don't know what the motive is, and I don't want to speculate because it's insulting to Michael. It's also insulting, in my opinion, when I read things like he could have possibly faked his own death so his wife could have his life insurance money. Could Michael have thrown his cell phone in the lake and started a new life somewhere else? Of course, there's always that possibility, but starting over at 70 years old is unlikely. He had a home and cars and a life. He would have likely taken the $1,000 in cash that was left in his truck at the house. You're going to need money to survive on. Think back to the Richie Edwards case. Many believe he started a new life and is alive and well living out of the country. The difference between Richie and Michael Chambers is Richie was 28 years old and a rock star, no wife and kids. He's He very well could be alive and living off the grid. Michael is 70. He's retired. He's a family man. He's raised his children. Michael can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. He has no rules to follow. He's not a good candidate for one to up and start a brand new life. Two private investigators were hired by the family. One believes that the patterns of the blood in the garage indicate that Michael was carried, maybe hit on the head and then taken to a car and put in the trunk. There were no signs of a struggle in the garage. If there was a fight going on, there would be shit knocked off the tables and scuff marks and so on. But the blood didn't go from the middle of the garage to the door. It's just kind of in the middle of the garage. Also, what kind of killer or kidnapper is kind enough to lock up your garage and turn the lights off? It likely was not a burglary gone wrong. Michael often worked in the garage with the garage door open, and sometimes people would see the classic cars and pull in and talk to Michael about them. Family says Michael would talk with anyone who stopped and asked about the cars. But remember, all his tools and his 12-gauge shotgun were right there, undisturbed. His vehicle wasn't stolen or any of his classic cars. He, he still had $1,000 in cash in his truck. Plus, his cell phone and his driver's license were missing. Who's going to steal a cell phone and driver's license and nothing else? If he was forcibly taken from his garage, there were no calls for ransom money or any of the other things that go along with kidnapping victims. I have watched countless interviews with Michael's family and friends. His children and grandchildren really love him and miss him, and his friends do too, especially those from his church and his car club. One person missing from all of these is his wife, Becca. In fact, one friend is convinced Becca killed Michael and she is very vocal about it. It seems like everyone is very divided now with no one speaking to to Becca. That's the impression I get, but I don't know the family, so I can't say for sure. With that being said, let's get into some of the reasons why people are so suspicious of Becca. These things do not necessarily make her guilty of murder, but they indicate that she is shady as fuck. Becca did not participate in any searches for Michael except for that first night when she reported him missing. She doesn't do interviews and she stopped talking to police. Remember, she called her neighbor over to help search that night. Some think it's strange that she went to the retired cop first, maybe as a way to be able to say, look, I had my cop friend with me helping me search. I don't know if I find that part strange, but there's a lot of opinions about that piece. This cop neighbor also says that the garage was locked when they got to it. Becca went and got her keys and unlocked it. He thinks it wasn't really locked, and she was almost pretending to unlock the door. 
Becca was having multiple affairs. In fact, she talked to one of the men the morning of the day Michael disappeared. Her cell phone activity was checked, and that's how it was discovered, that she also talked to him in the afternoon and the morning after her husband went missing. She canceled Michael and Justin's cell phone service 10 days after Michael was missing in the name of saving money. She sold Michael's truck, declared him dead after lying and saying it was just a temporary paper, and also sold one of the prize cars, a 1965 to a 69. I don't know exactly what year it is. It's a cherry red Mustang just weeks after he disappeared. The Mustang was a gift to her from Michael. It's sad because this man truly loved his wife. You can tell how much he loved her. She was the most important thing in the world to him. She then sold his entire collection of cars. She was talking to her lover that morning and also asking Michael to get her mascara around the same time. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not going to call my husband at 8 a.m. while I'm at work and ask him to pick up my mascara. He doesn't know what to buy. My husband would be completely lost if I sent him shopping for my makeup products. I'm not saying this makes a person guilty. Maybe other marriages do, you know, people do this for each other. I don't know. But if there's one thing I have to buy on my own, it's my makeup products. Michael's friend Penny at the car club said once Becca had said to her, Michael is not coming back. Penny's like, excuse me? (laughs) Becca says again, he's not coming back. And And she said it very sternly. This friend also said the car club had initially helped Becca in the beginning with food and finances, but stopped when they saw she was still attending her dance classes and getting her nails and her hair done. This was in the very early stages of her husband's disappearance. They thought it was Uh, abnormal to be out there living your best life and not searching for him and being sad like everyone else. I thought it was strange that the blood I told you about on the floor was bright red and possibly drawn in advance and stored in a vial with an anticoagulant, then dripped on the garage floor, possibly to stage the crime scene. Well, a normal person like me wouldn't know how to go about making the blood this way, but someone who worked in healthcare would. Becca was a home health aide, and that's just a coincidence there. The private investigators believe Becca is hiding information or knows way more than she's telling them. One says Becca's whereabouts are unaccounted for after 2 p.m. that day that Michael went missing. As well, her phone was completely turned off for an hour and a half. Who actually turns their cell phone off? Do normal people do that? I don't know because I never turn my cell phone fully off unless the battery died. As well, I go down so many rabbit holes investigating these cases, and I can tell you about 99% of folks believe that she had something to do with Michael's disappearance and likely his death. She may not have been the one who committed the act, but her boyfriend or a hitman certainly could have. One of Michael's friends said that Michael and Becca came to her house just a week and a half before he disappeared, and things were off. There was tension between them, and everyone at the gathering noticed it. This same friend also brought up a really good point. If Becca had Michael declared legally dead very early on, why did she not have a memorial gathering for him? This man was a firefighter for 36 years. He had so many accomplishments that deserved to be celebrated. Why not do something to honor his memory if you're going to be convinced that he's dead? I found the real estate listing from when Becca sold their house in 2018. This is a year after Michael disappeared. It's sad seeing all of his stuff in there. In the garage, there were lots of tools and a car lift. The rest of the house looks empty except for a couch, but his garage was still full of his stuff. She did sell a lot of his stuff, but these were just like regular garage items that were left behind. To this day in late 2022, Michael's body has never been found. No arrests have ever been made. Police believe his cause of death was suicide. If alive today, Michael is 75 years old. Although his family believes there's no longer he's no longer with us. It has been five years and no more clues have turned up in his disappearance. There is a Facebook page run by his daughter Susie called Bring Papa Home. It's updated regularly with messages about how much he's missed and a good source for updates in this case. It looks like the last major search held by law enforcement was in 2021 when over 400 acres were searched by police and volunteers. Klein Consulting, which is the private investigator firm handling Michael's case, disagrees with police. They stated, we believe firmly that whatever happened to Mr. Chambers happened to him at his house, and we believe his body is within a three square mile radius of his residence. 
Please contact the Hunt County Sheriff's Office if you have any information that could lead to the whereabouts of Michael Chambers so his family can get the closure they need. And if foul play was what caused this, the person that did this needs to be held accountable. Thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Take care, and much love to you all.